Thank you again for the invitation. Uh, this is a chance to catch you up on uh, things that I've caught up on in the last two years. Things that I didn't know a thing about until, I get this right, that's Burzell Park. I live right back in there, in the, behind the trees. Okay, In the winter time, when the leaves are rough, I can see the park. So every morning, I'm constantly reminded of the park. Uh, in May of 2017, an excavator showed up, okay, uh, to start digging for a reburial of the massasoit. I thought, well, I better find out a whole lot more about this. <laughs> so I started asking some questions. I've done some things. I, I've had a um, a uh, website on the King Philip War about 15 years ago, uh, which is fine. But uh, there's a lot more to the story I didn't know. Um, I also was involved in the replacement of the Hugh Cole Well Monument a few years back when Walter was around and uh, we got the family to pay for that. So even though it's been stolen a couple of times, we still have it oh back and glued there. Okay, hopefully once they realize it's not really brass or bronze that you know they give up. But I met this woman. Helen Jader. Anybody know Helen? No. She was no. uh, in Barrington and uh, she had gotten interested in creating a Soames Heritage Area. And she had spoken at the uh, Barrington uh, um, Preservation Society and then came over to Warren and spoke there. So for the first time I heard that term, Soames Heritage Area, and a whole concept that she had about uh, how to create a whole new area that would encompass all of Soames or the Southern District, okay, the home of the Massasoit, um, and encompass the Poconoket tribe. Poconoket, not Wampanoag, okay, because the name Wampanoag was first in the literature in 1702, uh -huh. never appeared before then. It was always Poconoket. But as you'll learn, uh, there was a reason why uh, the English wanted to get rid of the term Poconoco. So, this is the territory of the Poconoco tribe, not just Soames here, as this is Bicknell's map, see Poconoco mm -hmm. and Soames, okay? But this entire territory up to the Charles River in, in uh, what's now Boston, okay? And including. Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, but not the Cape. Okay? Because this was a different tribe, the Mashpees, who allied with the English to train yeah. the King Philip War. So, this was the domain of the Massasoit, um, celebrated in the Massasoit Spring, right around the corner here, but also indicative of people who had been living here for eight to 10,000 years. We say 8,000 simply because that's the earliest archeological evidence that people were here. But good estimates are that people probably moved into this area after the glaciers receded 12,000 years ago. Give them a couple thousand years for the trees and plants to grow and all of that for people to move in to hunt and fish. But uh, it's pretty reasonable to say 10,000 years of occupation here. Okay, uh, 10,000 years is a long time. That's 5,000 years before the pyramids, before Greece, before Rome, okay? Think about all that span of history that people were living here successfully until the 1500s when Europeans started arriving. So when the Europeans arrived, uh, they came for one reason, and that was for trade. Okay, to get the, the valuable resources that were here. Um, it included everything from wood and fish. Remember, England was denuded of wood, so they were bringing wood back to England. Uh, fish, certainly from Cape Cod and all the wonderful fishing banks that we had here, um, but also a trade for furs, and that became a huge commodity uh, along the coast in the 1500s. So people 
numbered uh, the, the various estimates, 70, 100,000, a lot of folks, okay, in uh, along the what's now Massachusetts and even up into Maine and New Hampshire, but uh, most of them were living on the coast. Um, and they had a very successful society. We have no indication that there were people were wiped out in, 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 uh, by starvation or uh, any other uh, problem, uh, though we don't have a recorded history to know that. Well, in 1616, some of those traders brought with them an unexpected gift, disease. And it is only up to speculation in terms of the diseases that they brought, um, smallpox, uh, uh, measles, uh, Tuberculosis, typhus, thank yeah. you. All kinds of possibilities, but nobody knows for certain. Um, so, but what we do know, because there were eyewitnesses who came and saw the devastation that those diseases uh, produced, 90% uh, of the population along the coast was dead, okay, over those three years, over that three year period of time. Um, the massasoit was living here. Warren, Barrington, depending on whether you want to follow Bicknell or, or Baker, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the debate goes on. But in any case, certainly close to where we are now. And uh, Massasoit uh, uh, and his people nearby here were not as heavily affected as people on the coast. So this became really the uh, stronghold of uh, the tribe uh, during that period of time. Meanwhile, they had lost, think of it, when you lose 90% of your population, you, you lose your elders and the history, you lose your warriors and the ability to defend yourself, you lose the people who could produce food, um, and so that whole catastrophe called the Great Dying along the coast had an enormous impact on the Massasoit. You notice I'm calling him the Massasoit. You know, the same way we'd say the president, okay? Massasoit wasn't his name, Osamequin was his name. Massasoit is a title, and a great chief. So, I always refer to him as the Massasoit. So we went up and met with John Carver on March 22nd, 1622. Brought 60 of his warriors there and appeared to, and fortunately had the good uh, fortune of having a translator uh, both Squanto and then Tisquantum uh, uh, were available. They had learned English because they had, in one case, uh, had dealt with the traders along the coast, particularly along in Maine, but also uh, Tisquantum had been captured and taken to England uh, for several years and learned English there. So when he came back to his native village of Patuxent, what we now know as uh, Plymouth, everyone he knew was dead. Imagine if you came back to Warren and everybody was dead. Mm -hmm. It was just amazing what happened. So the Massasoit gave the pilgrims who had arrived uh, in December a little bit of time because he wasn't sure what was going on, nor was he sure that he would be subject to the diseases that had affected everyone else along there. But by, by March uh, they decided it was time to have a meeting. and. He came to Plymouth, what we now know as Plymouth, uh, held a meeting. Um, I love these illustrations, they're very fanciful. <laughs> but, you know, it, it was, they did have one house, one house, one building there with a carpet, um, and exchanging a, a tobacco pipe was certainly uh, part of the routine. Not sure about the grandfather clock. You probably not. Yeah, really. oh, unless they brought it over in the main I haven't seen that. I it's wouldn't Victorian expect it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so they struck what we now know as the Wampanoag Treaty of 1621, celebrated on a coin. Anybody seen that coin? No. Anybody got a Sacagawea coin? I do. Yes. Turn it over. Oh, this oh, is wow. a Interesting. Yeah. Never thought of it's that. the only acknowledgement that the U.S. government, as far as I know, has ever given to the Wampanoag Treaty. And, of course, the Wampanoag Treaty is misnamed because the, the word Wampanoag was not in use until 1702. Okay. In any case, that's what 
It's called the Lampadoc Treaty. Do you know what year that coin was minted? 2011. 2011. In any case, uh, Ed Winslow, who was essentially the Secretary of State for the Pilgrims and on the Mayflower, decided after the successful treaty which guaranteed the peace between uh, the tribe here and the Pilgrims, uh, that he should meet this fellow, Massasoit Osamequin. And he knew that he lived here, so he arranged a walk with Hamden down here 42 miles on foot, took him two days, but they got here, okay, in about July 2nd, and met with the Massasoit, somewhere within probably a few hundred yards of here, okay, and had a very good meeting, and came back with an understanding that this was an alliance that was worth preserving. Of course, one notion is that the Massasoit's home was right here at the Massasoit Spring, just around the corner here. Um, we know, of course, that native villages were not permanent. They moved constantly because you run out of wood, you run out of fowl and game and fish, so you move around. Okay. And whether, in fact, that meeting took place here, no one will ever know. Uh, of course, Virginia Baker made a strong stand that it was here uh, with Guy Fessenden. And then uh, Tom Bicknell uh, uh, tried to shoot that uh, theory apart and said, no, it was over in Tyler Point you know, in Barrington. In any case, uh, there's no doubt that the Massasoit spent a good deal of time here, though he moved around a good deal. He would go up to uh, Middleborough and fish, he would go to uh, Norton and hunt, they would move inland during the winter time. Mm -hmm. um, I'll show you another location that he may have occupied during the winter. But undoubtedly, this encounter occurred somewhere in the local vicinity. Um, Winslow came back again two years later, hearing news that the Massasoit was ill, deathly ill, and again traveled down for two days. Um, met the Massasoit, uh, who was surrounded by um, members of his tribe who were wailing and moaning because it appeared that the Massasoit was about to die. In fact, that was the news that Winslow got the day before he arrived here, that he was already dead, but fortunately found that he was still alive and administered what any good pilgrim English leader would do because they had no doctors, you would give people the kinds of treatment or medicine that ordinarily people would have. I think at this point it was nothing more than some fruit compote. He did order chicken soup, but they didn't have any chickens, <laughs> so they had to send for a chicken. But in any case, what was, after scraping his tongue and doing all kinds of administrations, the Massasoit recovers, gains his eyesight back, and says to Winslow, Keen Winslow, you are my friend for life. And he meant that. And that relationship lasted until um, the Massasoit's death um, in 1661. You might wonder what this place looked like. I always imagined that at that period of time, um, this would all be covered with woods, right? With giant chestnut and oak trees and things of that sort. Not the case at all. Solmes was a area of cleared land. Mm -hmm. How did they clear it? Not with axes, they didn't have metal tools, with fire. Mm -hmm. And for centuries, spring and fall, they would burn off these large areas here for two reasons. One, it was easier to hunt because you would burn off the low brush, the, the berries and brambles and things, so you could easily travel there, but also so that you would have better access to the land and be able to use it to grow plants. So I just took some Google Maps. This is Tyler Point in Barrington. I erased all the, <laughs> you know, whatever else was there. I, I photoshopped in some, some woods in a village here, and here's even a trading ship here. This is probably what Warren looked like. It was known as Brooks Pasture, okay, in 1712. So it's likely that it was open space, 
where we are now. Um, there was a trading post in 1632, several theories about where that was, probably, Virginia says that it was probably on the Kikimuit on the west side, and there was a, would have been a settlement around there, but we don't know for certain. What we do know is that there were certainly native settlements around this area, and if you realize that people have been living here for 10,000 years, these are settlements that have been occupied and left and reoccupied and left and reoccupied over the centuries. Here's a guy who really liked the fact that there was open land. Miles Standish, though he was a military leader, he was kind of their real estate guy. And he came here and said, wow, this place is terrific. This is the garden of the patent and the flower, and I love the spelling, of the garden, <laughs> okay? Meaning that this was the prized place for the English, okay? So he had his eye on it and even bought some property at one point. Never lived here. And it's my understanding that the property that he went into a consortium with to buy yes. is the property that is over on the Tewissit side. Could very well be. Right. Going down Hugo Road and right. in that section. Yep. And um, you see it in, in maps and things. Yep. Yeah. That was that it was Standish land? Well uh, there, there It was Standish and two or three others. Uh, Bo Borden. Borden, okay. Um Betsy Borden who yep. I knew uh, as a young person. Uh -huh. And um, it, it went back into that that section. Excellent. Yeah. Well, it's so good that it's still cleared land. Well, well that's one of, of the attractions of Warren was yep. that there was so much water yep. that it made for good agricultural land. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. This was a wonderful place. And you think about it, you know, the access to water, transportation, water for fish year-round, mm -hmm. um, but close by to forests for hunting and things of that sort. This was, this was, this was like Southern California here. Okay? Mm -hmm. This was the place to live, all right? Um, I put this slide in because I just did a presentation uh, um, Saturday over at uh, Wachamoka Square Day um, in East Providence about, I have a whole presentation about um, the differences between the English and the Poconoka tribe. But uh, very briefly, um, the, the way that the native people saw this is that you live with the land, not on it. Um, you hunt animals, you don't raise them. They were totally confused when the, the English brought cows and pigs here. They'd never seen those animals, nor did they ever consider that someone would take animals and feed them and then slaughter them. I mean, you think about it, 10,000 years of hunting, and suddenly you've got these strange animals that people feed. Crazy. Mm -hmm. um, they would manage land and not acquire it. Um, they had use agreements, and there's a lot of discussion about these purchases of land through uh, treaties. Initially, uh, the tribes had little understanding of a purchase, because no one would buy land. What is that? God owns the land. What you can do is have use agreements, and among tribes they did have agreements about you can hunt here, you can fish here, that kind of thing, and those would change over time. But um, these deeds, these sudden documents that the English were bringing were very strange to this group. They eventually caught on and then, in fact, entered into uh, those agreements uh, in the 1650s or so. Um, and began to understand what this idea of property was, that if you own something, no one else can use it, which to them initially made no sense at all. Uh, religion was part of nature, was something you exercised every minute of every day. It's not something you do on Sunday. They didn't have a Sunday. Um, um, and they didn't go to churches because everything was spiritual, okay? as opposed to the English who kind of had religion in a box. Um, and then an acceptance of what can't be controlled. There was a lot of uh, Native understanding that the world was as it was. Um, but the English wanted to rule the world, 
and dominate it. After all, that's what's in the scriptures, right? Big differences. Well, uh, moving ahead a few years to 1636, we had our friend Roger, you know his story. He first came from England in 1631 and spent a year in uh, Plymouth. And that's where he got to know Osamequin. Well, they didn't like his, uh, his view of uh, religion and government, so off he went to Salem. Well, he was there for another year, for almost two years, and uh, living in this house, I guess, in Salem, um, when the authorities at the Plymouth Bay Colony got wind of what he was telling people about a separation between the church and the state, a radical idea and something that would doom the English experiment there. So they sent the authorities to get him and take him back to England in January of 1636. Roger got wind of that. Mm -hmm. He left. Okay. And walked. Okay, you ready for this? Walked from Salem down here to um, Psalms in the worst winter known then the entire Narragansett Bay was frozen over, it was that cold, okay? Well, by the time he got here, he was not in good shape. So, he went to his friend Osamequin, who sheltered him, nearby at Margaret's Cave. How many of you have been to Margaret's Cave? We should do a walk sometime. Is that Devil's Rock? No, it's different than Devil's Rock is not far from there. Yeah. But this is Margaret's Rock, or Margaret's Cave. Uh, just over the Warren line in Swansea, mm -hmm. on property now owned by Dr. Charlie McCoy. Uh, but this is marked by the Williams family. And I've led half a dozen walks there with uh, uh, Keith Morton, who lives nearby there. He's a faculty member at uh, Providence College. And, uh, but we believe, no one knows for certain, but this may have been the place where he was sheltered. If you built a lean-to, against this rock and then you have fire in the back, etc. You could stay warm. But we also believe, just again from our speculation, that that was the winter encampment of, of Osamequin at that time. It would only make sense. They wouldn't stick Roger out in the middle of the woods by himself. He would be part of a village there. Um, and that's the kind of place that they would go to. Not far from Sachem's Knoll, I'll talk to you about that in a bit, King's Rock and Route 136. Well, Roger did recover after 14 weeks and hiked up to Omega Pond where the uh, um, Massasoit said, uh, you, that's a place you can occupy and start your colony there. Well, that worked out for a few weeks. He got everything planted, plants started to grow, and then he gets word from Plymouth, you're on our land, get out. So that's when Roger had to remove <laughs> and go across the Seekonk River. So uh, Roger got in a canoe and crossed the Seekonk River and met Canonicus on the other side. So goes the story, you know, what cheer he top and all that. And eventually went around and found, founded Providence, etc. Um, had Osamequin not sheltered him during that winter, and had he died, no Providence, no Rhode Island, and all of New England and the American Constitution would have been different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we would have had the charter um, 1663. Right, yeah. And, and he had to secure that charter in 63 because the um, Mass Bay Colony wanted to take over Rhode Island at that point. So Roger goes back to England and gets a charter on his way. He writes key to the languages of America, just for something to do on board the ship, I'm sure. Right? So it is very important Pardon? in our early history. Yes, absolutely. And it was the first document that guaranteed religious freedom anywhere in America. So we could do a whole talk about Roger. Well, I assume you've all been down to the Roger Williams Memorial, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, absolutely a great place. 30 minutes, you do the whole thing. You'll see the painting inside of what uh, Providence might have looked like in 1650. That's a contemporary painting by Gene Blackburn. 
but uh, I like the way it's laid out where you see essentially North Main Street. Here's Smith Hill where the State House is now. Uh, here's the Great Salt Pond where we now do water fire, and I love it that that's still there. Mm -hmm. And then back here is Nudaconica Hill. How many people have been to Nudaconica Hill? Yeah. I've never heard of it, okay, <laughs> until I started on this project. And, and Helen Trader, who said, you've got to go to Nudaconica Hill. In fact, you can come up there on Saturday. I'll be doing a talk and leading a group up there. But that's the western boundary of Providence and was the, was the western boundary of uh, Canonicus's um, um, land, if you will. Uh, they used to have meetings up there on the top of Nudaconica Hill among the Massasoit, uh, I'm sorry, the Massachusetts, the Nipmuc, or further, further north and west, the Narragansett, and then the Poconoca. So it was a very important place, as were many mountains. It was one of the mountains where they would light fires and signal fires, they could do a signal fire to people down at Mount Oak or up to Mount Wachusett. Okay. I'm not going to go through all of this, it would take another hour, but these are the land transfers uh, that occurred starting with the Wanamoiset purchase and then uh, uh, the um, Psalms land divided from Rehoboth. Uh, which was the, the first purchase, and then Swansea, which covered the entire area for a period of time, and then Barrington separated from Swansea, but then Warren incorporated most of Barrington, <laughs> and then Swansea became Swansea, and now we have the current uh, configuration. And what I learned was that this line, I always wondered, how did that line come up? And I thought, well, there, there, there must be a reason for that line being there. That's the 1747 agreement that the courts finally struck. There's no reason at all for that line there, other than the fact that somebody put a ruler on a map and drew a line. That's where our boundaries came from. They, I went down and looked for the document for, you know, normally when you strike a boundary, you have to go and do a survey. They never surveyed it. Mm -hmm. I looked at the survey map. There's nothing there, okay? It was a total artificial boundary, right? As were many of these boundaries over time. First settlement, 1643, Newman Church. Anybody been there or the cemetery across yeah. the street? Yeah. Right, absolutely. Uh, that's the fourth building that they have there, but you can still see evidence, particularly if you're a carpenter, you're going to go there because that's where most of your relatives are buried. And um, we lost the Ring of the Green in the King Philip War. All the houses were burned there, but we know approximately where it was. Hunts Mills, how many people have been there? Good. They used to fish there. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's on the Ten Mile River. It's still yeah. a great right river, right and people the... still fish there. It was uh, Phillipsdale. Yes, right. That's where my dad was born. Well. That was, that was an important area because it was the first place where the colonists were able to establish some mills along the river and, you know, grind wheat, uh, uh, grain and uh, have uh, fabric uh, woven there and it still has a nice dam there now. So it's worth a visit, but that was, that was where the English really uh, got a foothold. And of course, that wasn't East Providence then, it was Rehoboth. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you go into Rehoboth, now you'll find some evidence of the 17th century, uh, mostly in terms of signage. There's, this dam is really post 1700s, but it gives you some idea of some of the mills and dams that they had there in Rehoboth. Um, and they've done a nice job with signage. Uh, to show you some of the things that uh, existed at that place. So we're getting up to uh, close to 1675, um, the outbreak of the conflict known as King Philip's War. And at that point in time, see these little yellow spaces? Those are English settlements. And if the rest of the map could show Newport down here, that would be another one, as would Portsmouth. Okay. So the only land that was remained 
totally under the control of the Poconoke population was the peninsula, the Mount Hope and Bristol. In fact, it was just below Franklin Street here, where they had a, uh, a fence all the way along there. Okay, that boundary was changed after Bristol decided to. Uh, there were some some deals uh, around land. Okay, so 1675, the population of the tribe had gone from approximately 70,000 at 1620 down to 700 mm -hmm. by 1675, primarily due to disease. The same infectious diseases that were that killed people in 1616, 1619 continued to affect people. And there were outbreaks, some in the 1630s, some in the 1640s, that devastated large sectors of the native population, leaving the English population alone because they were immune from their previous exposure. So here you are. Now, Massasoit, the Massasoit has died in 1661. His son, Wamsuda, is called up to uh, Plymouth and returns home and dies on the way. Um, the Poconocets would say that's because of poisoning and they have the bill of sale of the rat poison that was purchased at that time, yes. Other people say it was some other infectious disease we will never know for certain. But what was certain was that the relationship that had been very positive with the Poconocets between them and the pilgrims was beginning to erode largely because not the pilgrims in Plymouth who struck the agreement, but Mass Bay Colony, who were beginning by this time to really intrude into this area. They never had that agreement. You now have a whole new generation who doesn't even remember what it was like before the English came. And lots of legal disputes. Um, if you read about Sassamon, who was the praying Indian who um, was found um, murdered lying under the ice up near uh, Middleborough and three native people were accused and then tried by the English. Um, that was pretty much the straw that broke this particular camel's back and it wasn't long after that that uh, a native lad over here probably off of Child Street at uh, Judd Winslow's farm, uh, sh uh, shot a native person who was looting the farm while everyone was at church. That was, he then had drawn the first blood. That meant that the war could begin. Philip probably did not want a war. He was initially did not see the value in that, but his warriors were so concerned that this little group of 700 Give it another 20 years and they'd all be gone. Okay. So we won't go into a lot of details of the war that's worth at least a couple of hours, but it was an awful war on both sides. Uh, thousands of people on both sides were killed. Um, really, I believe the effort was uh, because um, you recall that uh, Philip escaped went uh, over to Tiverton and with help with Mutimo's help uh, went up the Maori Path and across the Taunton River and then went up to Deerfield and began burning villages all along there. What was happening was the English were beginning to move first back to Boston and then some back to England. Others went down to, to uh, Newport where it, it was uh, Narragansett territory. Um, but for all intents and purposes it looked like what they were trying to do is to simply get the English to leave go back to where you came from, mm. okay? Uh, but, you know, obviously there wasn't uh, a good feeling on anybody's part about that. And that war ended uh, down in uh, um, Mount Hope and the Myrie Swamp when uh, Church, who had been leading the militia from uh, England, um, um, his gun misfired. Um, John Alderman, who was a praying Indian, whose brother had been killed by <laughs> Uh, King Philip shot him and, in the heart and he died there. They drew and quartered his body, put his head on a pike, and took it up to Plymouth where it stayed for over 20 years. So, I mean, it was a brutal war. 
Although if you want to know about brutal war and their tactics, you need to go to England during this period of time. Oh, yeah. uh, they would make this stuff look like, you know, child's play. I mean, they, they would brand people, stick molten pikes through their tongue, uh, you know, I mean, uh, burn people alive, etc. That's, that's what the English were coming from. And they brought those technologies, if you will, with them in warfare. So the war ended. Um, there's a marker um, where the um, first militia gathered up at Miles Garrison. I hope you might have been up there. It's at the end of Barneyville Road, next to the Bungtown Bridge. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, these markers, all they do is say, these are the people who died here. You don't know why, what happened, where. Yeah. So we're going to get another marker, oh, nice. you know, a nice marker that will explain the whole story. This is what the garrison looked like before it was demolished or burned um, around the turn of the century. Uh, this is where uh, King Philip was slain there on Mount Hope. You can go see this. Is that the well? Pardon me? There, the there's, a well, there, there's a little well next to it. It's all grown over now. I was just there a few months ago. And, uh, yeah, it needs to be cleared out. Um, church met with Anawan, who was uh, Philip's uh, lieutenant, or, or general, really, uh, um, at Anawan Rock, uh, where they surprised him and captured him. Then Church and Anawan spent the night trading war stories, you know, like two good generals, you know, like, oh yeah, we did this. And, and he, he, you know, he could have killed them, he didn't, and uh, sent him up to uh, Plymouth thinking, well, they just try him and stuff. No, they hung him, and so that was, that was the end. Um, although the war, parts of the war continued on up into Maine for about three years. So, here are some of the places around here that you can see things from prior to 1700. Uh, if you're over in Swansea, you can find the old area, Eddie burial ground, but it's the Eddie family, and now they're not taken care of because they don't want anybody in there. Uh, but certainly in Rehoboth, there are a number of cemeteries. Anybody recognize this one? That's uh, up on uh, uh, 136 there, uh, just past Choppies <laughs> oh, yeah. on the right. Yeah. Um, it's some really interesting uh, uh, places. Ancient Little Neck Cemetery in Riverside. If you haven't been over there, it's definitely worth a trip. Okay, uh, you will see not only uh, Tom Willett's grave. Uh, who, he was governor of New York twice because he spoke Dutch and you know was able to um, deal with uh, the Indian problems that they were having there as well. Um, this, of course, is uh, Serpentine Road uh, Cemetery and John Miles. We don't know exactly where he was buried, but that's in Tyler Point. Mm -hmm. So all of these are around here. You just need to know where to look, and they're all on the website I put together. Uh, anybody know Byron Key over at yes. Farm? Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Well, Byron uh, was very nice and gave me a tour of his property, showed me some of the Native American uh, tools that he found uh, on his property. And he tried to convince me that the house there was was built in 1625, and I said, no, Byron. <laughs> but, Everybody then, tries to move their date back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but the farm has not changed since that time. No, um, and where the farm is, Yes. Um, where the pavilion is for the clam bakes, well, oh, yeah. the yeah. yeah. dining club or the one um, that According to the book, The Mayflower, right. the first mention of um, a baked shellfish oh, okay. in the ground. Yep. Was when first they, clam bake. The first real clam bake yep. is down along that edge because uh -huh. the uh, Native Americans um, went across from, say, Bristol to that area. Yeah, at the Narrows. To have um, a, a powwow. Sure. And um, they baked. The Absolutely. shellfish. Yeah. So I bore my children every time we're at a clam bake with that little bit of information. Yeah. Well, but the main thing about it, I mean, the history so we have good. lost in this area. I mean, if there was recorded history for the last 10,000 years, imagine the stories there would be. Mm. Imagine the, the gatherings. And, you, know, <coughs> you know, we always think of these tribes as not connected with one another, not at all. They, you know, there was a lot of interchange among tribes. Mm -hmm. And um, particularly, um, uh, in, even if you go up the Blackstone River there, when the fish would run there, all kinds of tribal people would come from more than 100 miles there 
to fish and have celebration, etc. So, you know, it's not like these tribes had the absolute barriers among them. Um, up here uh, at uh, Joetta's uh, uh, Chase Farm, uh, 1693 King's Grant Farm there, hasn't changed since that time. Brigham Farm up in East Providence hasn't changed since that time. Uh, so there's still plenty of places around here. If you look at some of the, this is uh, Soames Woods in Barrington. Um, this is Wayposset uh, um, Preserve in uh, Bristol, next near the Narrows. Okay, go down Narrows Road. Okay, but we also know from archaeological evidence that there were many villages there. Lots of people occupied that land. If you look at it, it's fabulous. Mm. What a place to live down there. And it was an unending supply of yes, shellfish. Absolutely. Year so there must food. be a midden somewhere that oh, is there huge. Are hundreds, hundreds of middens around. And mm. all up and down the Kikimua. So, you know, just over time we've lost all that. And plus, you have to understand that over that 10,000 year period of time, the bay has risen yes. considerably. So most of where the archaeological evidence is, is out Underwater. underwater, okay, and until we because get another ice age, we'll never find we'll it again. Uh, my understanding is that at 14,000 years ago, which is a mere flicker of time, yep. um, the the whole of the Kikimuit and and the configurations out as far as uh, Martha's Vineyard oh, was, yeah, was some uh, mud flats. And then oh, the tide would yeah. come in, and, and you'd have that little trickle yeah. going up. Yeah. No, this you wouldn't recognize this place then, mm. right? Um, glaciers were pretty good at dating glaciers, and they started to receive about recede about twelve thousand years ago. Yeah. But it took a while. You know, yeah. it didn't happen overnight, mm -hmm. centuries. Yeah. So with all of these places, uh, uh, I think. This is also in Barrington along uh, the Hampton Trail there. Uh, there's some wonderful places around here that haven't changed in, in uh, 400 years. How many people recognize this place up here? Huh? Oh. Ever been there? I'll tell you, you drive by it every other day. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know where Johnson's Market is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Tim Johnson owns half of this, which is King's Rock. It's on the west side of Route 136, okay, and then across the street, Delisandro Farm. You, it's a little tough to see it right now because of all the brush that's grown up along the fence there. But what's that boulder doing there? What is that? It just got dropped. Yeah. And melted. Well, that's exactly what um, when I talked to uh, Tim Ives, the state archaeologist, and I said, "Hey, Tim, what about this rock up there?" Oh, that's a glacial erratic. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, Tim, I understand that. The glaciers took large stones, carried them down here, some of them from Canada, and then when the glaciers melted, that's where they stayed. But I said, Tim, there's something interesting about this. Mm -hmm. There's some stones under there. Not just this one, there's stones all the way around there. How do those stones get there? Glaciers don't put stones under rocks. And why is this rock situated on the only granite outcropping anywhere in that vicinity at the top of a knoll, Sachem's Knoll, mm -hmm. okay? Why is it across the road from the National Grinding Stone that uh, Virginia and other people have described, uh, where Native women used to grind corn by rolling a rock along a groove that you could still see up there, okay? What's all that about? Is this just a glacial erratic that just happened to be there and happened to place itself on a half a dozen stones? No. I think people put it there. Ah, oh, could have been some college kids, you know. I said, I don't think college kids want to spend weeks with, you know, it'd take 25 guys to move that thing, okay? That's not college kids. This is a calendar rock. This is a rock placed there specifically by native people. Now they may have found it somewhere in the vicinity and rolled it up there, but that's there for a reason, because that helped them orient themselves to the sky, to the stars, and the connection to the granite outcropping is to the underworld, not hell, 
but the belief that there's a world underneath that controls things up above. Okay? So if you look at balanced or perched rocks around New England, you'll see this kind of thing everywhere. Okay? Just happens that we have one here and we don't know anything about it. <laughs> and I'd love to find somebody who could say, oh, I remember it, is, somebody moved it there, or got a story? Let me know, please. Because right now, I'm calling that a Native American sacred site. Okay? Other sites, uh, behind Swansea Town Hall, Abrams Rock, um, of course, Mount Hope, and the King Philip Seat, probably a number of you have been there already. And this is the place up in New Connecticut Hill, where Native people used to meet with the intertribal gathering. Seeing all that, a uh, couple of other places around here that you're, I'm sure, familiar with. Bristol, which after the war was laid out, uh, the only uh, grid-style layout in uh, all of Rhode Island, mm -hmm. okay? Um, that was uh, land purchased, uh, given to four proprietors, who then sold off the land in order to raise money to pay the war debts. Uh, but that was the king who had decided that. So this is a king's land grant. Um, the first house in Bristol, you go yeah. by it all the time. Mm -hmm. Still you, there. you know where that wood, the wood to build the house came from? England. England. Right. They brought it over on ship. Okay. Built the house. Why did they build the house? You had to build a house, a parsonage, to get a pastor. You had to have a pastor to get a church. You had to have a church to have a town. So they couldn't have a town uh, until they had all of this. So this is Nathaniel Bosworth's house, laid <coughs> around called Silver Spring, and they built a meeting house. This is somebody's imagination in terms of what it looked like on the common there. Uh, that, of course, was raised, and now the state house is there. <coughs> um, but there's still some artifacts in the church museum, including a pew in from that original church, and ch silver chalices that were given them, you can see uh, uh, grave markers. There are no graves under there. They're still buried back of the town common. They did that. They moved all oh, the yeah. they moved all the Ooh, markers, so. but they left all the bodies. Yeah, the bodies. Yeah. So now, when you're in the playground, you're playing over the bodies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Even even the cemetery that's across the street. Yeah. The bodies are still in the common. Oh, they're being right. Uh, but that's the the first three-story building in all of Rhode Island and. Uh, of course, you know the story about Lafayette staying there and one thing or another. George, too. Didn't George stay there, too, or just Lafayette? Um, uh, no, I don't know George. if George stayed there, but they did have meetings there about the Battle of Rhode Island. Yeah, no, right. I know It's that. really important I building. George stayed right. there, too. It was right down the street from Fort Hill, so... It's been for sale a hundred times. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a great building. It is. I haven't been inside. Yeah, it's wonderful. Elm Farm, I haven't been inside. Well, Elm Farm is not the whole building, it's really just this little L in the back here. It's this piece, and that had been moved from another location. But those are the only, that and these in the Bosworth House, the only three houses prior to 1700 that I could find in Bristol. If somebody knows of another one, let me know. Now, that's, that's it. And then around here, uh, the, other, uh, the Joseph Martin House, uh, this is at the end of the bridge to the White Church in Barrington. Yep. Okay, you know that one. Uh, the John Martin House uh, um, on Route 6. Uh, now, yeah. you'll go by then and say 1728, but Carl Becker from the uh, uh, Historical Association uh, swears yeah. that there was a house there before 1700. That they, that they would often, uh, houses would burn and they would build them yeah. on the same way. What I love about it is it's one place that you can actually go in, and the, the Colonial Dames have, have uh, they do nice tours there on Sunday afternoons, July through September. Uh, so it's a place you can get a feel for a 17th century house down here and not have to go to the Arnold House or mm -hmm. some other I've, I've been there. It's nice. It is nice. Very yeah, good. they do a good job. And they, and they have uh, a volunteer docent mm -hmm. uh, from the high school uh, who are well trained and do a great job. Of course, we all know uh, about the Hale Noons Farm. Um, Mr. Barbosa's let me in there, and I've taken a little internal tour. I'd like to do another one at some point. If anybody's interested, let me know. Um, but I think he's back to living there. He was renting it out for a period of time. Um, that house needs yeah, that, restoration. Uh, yep. the, uh, wasn't it the barn that they burned down and then were forced to rebuild, rebuild it? Right. Yeah. 
and, and the barn, and so the barn is not historic, but the house is, it's got a, it's a wonderful, huge chimney that, you know, there's well, the fireplaces all over the John, is that hail a part of our hail? Yeah. yeah, that was Judge whatever, but Carl Bodensee did a, um, an archaeological dig there, so there's been a lot added to the, to the right. basic, to the basic 1682 and, house. Uh, Walter and uh, Bonnie Warren uh, went all through that place, and they were they they did the work on the uh, uh, National Historic Register mm. on that, and tried to convince the owner to uh, get it uh, um, taken back to its original. Although you have to take a lot out of the oh, the would, 18th. I mean, you wouldn't right. have the house that's there now if you've would, taken everything out. It would out. cost you. Probably a couple million dollars to get this restored. Yeah. And oh, to bring, to bring it all the way back to yeah. sixteen. Well, you'd also be taking a lot of stuff along the way. Is you'd be taking a lot of structure away. Yeah. yeah. What's What's really neat is in the in the kitchen, there's a, a trap door in, uh, and a cistern down below. That's like a room size cistern mm -hmm. for water. There, it's wow. yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Um, the only 17th century house I could find in Seekonk was the William Hunt House. And then the Kingsley House in Rehoboth, uh, right along um, no, Pleasant Street, what is it? Just just over the line in, in uh, Rehoboth. But I've only found ten houses prior to 1700 anywhere in these eight towns. Um, yeah, because a lot a lot of things were destroyed in the war. Everything was burned, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and the, not every house in Providence was burned, but no. the, none of them exist now. So. It's difficult to find anything from there. Well, uh, I'll just finish with the, this is uh, where this all started with the Massasoit reburial. Did I tell you the story about Charles mm -hmm. Carr and all that? Okay, so you, you know how those items were removed and now they're back in a vault uh, underground with this over and uh, over top of it. And the Mashpees, they were able to gather everything simply because they were um, federally recognized in 2007, uh, whereas the Poconocets could not do that. Um, the Poconocets were not happy that the Mashpees did this without involving the Poconocets. I mean, the whole deal from the Poconocets' point of view is here's the Mashpees who didn't, uh, were, were not expunged from the area the way the Poconocets were after the war, who sided with the English, who were given a reservation, and who basically got sort of favored status. They were also praying Indians there. They were Christianized. Mm. So the Poconocets got the raw deal and the Mashpees got the better deal on that. Yeah. And then they've been able to kind of trump up the whole thing uh, to, um, now they will tell you, oh yes, we include the Poconocets. Well, yeah, there are people who are Poconocets who are part of the Mashpee, uh, part of their Wampanoag Federation. Okay, but their claim that they were the original tribe here is not based in fact. Hmm. Okay, so there's a, as is the case among many family <laughs> feuds, <laughs> there are some differences of opinion about that. But uh, I'm I'm satisfied that the Poconoka tribe, um, who today um, numbers about. Uh, uh, 300 people in this area. They don't all live right here in town. They, they live in the area. Um, Most of them are down Charleston, aren't they? Well, the, the Narragansetts are down there. Down, the Narragansetts yeah. are Bill in Guy Charleston. Bill Guy is the Sagamore. He lives in Barrington uh -huh. uh, on Phil's Avenue. Um, uh, she, uh, she's the uh, council president right now, uh, Deborah running here. Uh, she lives over in Warwick. Um, this guy lives down in Marion. Um, he lives in uh, Rehoboth. Uh, I'm not sure where these two live, um, but you know they're in the area. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the problems, if you want to claim federal recognition, you have to show continuous occupation of the area. Well, this was a tribe who were expunged from the area, yeah. genocided from the area. Right. How can they claim that they were here when you were, if you said you were Poconoka in 1712, they could shoot you on sight, mm. okay? I mean, there was no way they could claim continuous occupation. Bill, um, actually, uh, his family is down in Connecticut, um, and uh, he grew up in Providence, mm. uh, but now, now lives uh, here in, in Barrington. 
So there's really an effort just in the last 20 years for the Poconoco tribe to kind of reclaim things and, and really rediscover their own history and, and become more public about this. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, you know, when I was growing up, if you said you were Indian, you were subject to all kinds of ridicule and problems. Whereas today, people claim, want to claim that. Look at Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> and how do you do your genealogy? Uh, right. Well, she, her story is the same as mine. Yeah. <laughs> I, I you know, what, what, she had the same father? Captain no. It, oh, please. <laughs> well, she does have a little bit, but it's small. But the thing it's is, that she big. was told by her family right. that she, you know, yeah, right. in, uh, Native American, uh, same as and, I was, because mine was that's, whole cloth. That's how Native ancestry is... Uh, derived. It's from your relationships. Yes. It's not from your DNA or your bloodline or anything of that sort. It's who you're related to. And they will all tell you, you know, I'm the grand, my so and so was my grandparent, and their great grandparent was, and their great grandparent. You know, yeah, so that's the genealogy all the way. But how, and right. how do you prove it? Right. You can't prove it. You know. But, you What's, know, why would go, anyone go to all that effort if yeah. they just. You know, if, if things weren't legitimate, I I have no problem with the folks I'm working with. Should. Everything I'm talking to you about is, is on this point? website. Thank you. There's 163 pages on it now, awesome. and uh, I keep adding more and more and more as we go. This the video from tonight will be on there. Just uh, let me finish here with the you know the whole thing about this heritage area, because that's the whole point of this. That I'm um, I'm on a 10-year quest to create a new heritage area, you know about the Blackstone Valley heritage area. The heritage areas uh, uh, exist all over the country, there are 54 of them now, um, and what they do is weave together places that have little things. Um, if you don't have the Grand Canyon or Niagara Falls, you know, but you've got a lot of historic places, then what you do is you create a heritage area. You're probably familiar with the Blackstone Valley heritage area, that's the same thing. You know, they did that before the Museum of Work and Culture, and all they had was Slater Mill, which really wasn't all that well known mm -hmm. at the start. But now there's stuff all the way up to Worcester, all kinds of stuff, and it's now a national park. They, they, it's National Park Service um, is helps you start out with a heritage area. Not many of them graduate to national parks, but it'll, they'll, the feds will give you three hundred thousand dollars a year forever if you get this status. So I'm trying to get this uh, set up. I, I would even be happy if Bob Billington would extend the Blackstone down to here. That would be all right, you know, because uh, it's hard to administer these things. But uh, first stage is to get everybody to know about this. I'm kind of wrapping up two and a half years of doing that and <laughs> research. Uh, next stage is to get the business community behind it. And I'm, I've got I've been to all the Rotary Clubs, and uh, the uh, East Providence Chamber of Commerce Director loves this stuff and is fully behind it, and I'm going to be starting to buttonhole some business people around here to say, you know what, this could be an attraction. This could be something that would draw people from not only around the country, but around the world. Okay. Wow. I want to create an annual event here in town, at Burr's Hill, Good. the burial place of the Massasoit, um, and invite, first we're going to start with a smaller event next June 28th uh, with, the, with the tribe, the Poconoka tribe. It'll just be essentially a powwow, if you've ever been to a powwow. There's a lot of drumming and dancing and some exhibits and one thing or another. It's not, they do that all the time. It's not going to be hard to do that. Uh, but then the following year, that's when I really want things to get going, because that's 1621, 400th anniversary of Ed Winslow's visit oh, to the Massasoit yeah. down here. Okay? Uh, we all know about the, the Quahog Festival. I want this to be the annual event in Warren. Okay? The big deal. Uh, so. And I um, want to say thank you so much for coming. And, um, and well, I have your email. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. And you've actually come yeah. to the Children's Museum and done... So that I'm the director of education at the Children's Museum. Yeah, good. And you guys came and did. Um, They're in Providence, you mean? Yes, in Providence. Oh, okay. Yeah, and you came. And again, on the 30th, if anybody wants to be part of the effort to uh, 
uh, help the Pocono itself, Pocono as well.